All right, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to the Pro Football of Fame. My name is Jerry Shockey. I'm the Director of Youth and Education here at the Pro Football of Fame. And we're excited to bring to you here today a special program we do. We do this program called Story of Pro Football, uh, where we talk about the museum and the history and the artifacts and all these sorts of things. And we'll get that here in just a second. Actually, I've got a special guest here today that's going to describe one of those pretty unique artifacts that we have here at the, at the Pro Football of Fame. But before we do that, one thing we always like to do with any group is convey exactly who we are here at the Pro Football of Fame and what it is that we do. And one of the best ways to do that, I'm just gonna go ahead and share a screen with you guys. And what you're gonna see pop up is a map here. And you'll see, first of all, for the students that are tuning in, that could be watching across the country or across the globe, you'll see here in Northeast Ohio, we are home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, this is, if we zoom into Northeast Ohio, you'll see here, zoom in. Uh, we can see the Pro Football Hall of Fame there. And the next to us is an interesting football field because it's Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium. This is where the in, annual enshrinement ceremony. So when we talk about that bronze bus, we can talk about that enshrinement ceremony where the guys are enshrined, meaning their bronze bus is put on display here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That takes place the, the first full week in August. There's a Hall of Fame game, which is broadcast on national TV. Uh, there's a concert for legends, all kinds of great stuff that happens in that first week of, of really when football kicks off, the NFL season kicks off with the first preseason game. This year, gonna be the Dallas Cowboys playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. But let me give you guys a sneak peek into the Hall of Fame real quick. Looking for something to do this weekend? How about a destination that's exciting, inspiring, and located right in your own backyard? The Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio has it all. The scores, the stories, the legends of the game. The interactive exhibits have something for everyone, from the diehard supporter to the casual fan. Get ready for a unique experience that you'll never forget. So what are you waiting for? Get off the bench and get into the game. Plan your visit to the Pro Football Hall of Fame today. Okay, all right, and so one of the things we like to do, and we'll just do this very quickly. Again, this is kind of a shortened version. We do uh, 50, 60 minute interactions where we actually connect and can see and talk to classrooms of students uh, and talk about these wide variety of programs we have. So we'll what we're trying to do is condense these down into 15 or 20 minute programs where your student, your teachers, if you wanna send this home to your, to your students, uh, you know, send them as homework, extra work, whatever it might be uh, while they're at home right now during this time, is it just giving you more unique resources to use at your, at your, at your, for your students at their houses. And so uh, one of the things we like to do is convey exactly who the Hall of Fame is and what it is we do. And again, we won't have time to show you this video, just uh, that's in the full version of the program. But what we'll show you here today is our mission here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame is to honor the heroes of the game, preserve its history, promote its values, and to celebrate excellence everywhere. Our vision is not just about the past, it's the future, it's not just Canton, about Canton, it's the world. It's not just a great museum for football, and it is a great museum for football. And we're gonna talk about that museum part today, uh, but it's a message of excellence everywhere. And then our values, what we believe the Hall of Fame stands for, and what the game of football stands for. And there's so many values, you could, we could come up with hundreds of values, but really we think they boil down to these uh, five, commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence. And so today, you'll see me pop back up on the screen here with you guys. Today, what we're going to do is share about one of those special artifacts that we have here. And I'm going to show you one. Now, I'm not wearing gloves. Now, typically when we preserve, and Herb knows this, when we preserve artifacts, we're wearing gloves because the oils and things on our fingers can rub off, damage those artifacts. But one of the things the curator says about, the, about our collection, that if it's something heavy, it's probably better not to wear slippery gloves and drop the artifact than, 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 than to wear gloves and maybe not get fingerprints on them. But one of the popular artifacts that, even though we know kids, you, you, you go to a museum, what's the first rule you know in a museum, kids? Don't touch, right? Well, people still touch the bronze bust. I think it's, it's, they're infatuated with the noses and they touch them and, they, and you can see this, how they wear out a little bit more in the nose and other areas because that's the most popular place to touch. But what I have for, here for, uh, for you here today is a bronze bust, a guy by the name of Sid Luckman. He was quarterback for the Bears. You guys would have no clue who he is, uh, but a great quarterback for the Chicago Bears. And so this is his bronze bust. But when we look at this bust, it's like, man, this, this is a piece of art. You know, this is an amazing piece of art. And there is a long process that it takes to get to this bronze bust. And so what we have is one of our experts on this bronze bust, uh, one of our amazing volunteers that connected in from his house to share with you guys here today a little bit about this bronze bust and how that process takes place. And it's our good friend, Herb Garns. Uh, Herb, if you wanna take over for a minute, uh, feel free to go ahead and describe to these young people the bronze bust and what it has to, what the process it goes through to get there. So Herb. Thank you, Jerry, good morning. Yes, it is unique at the Hall of Fame, honors its and Chinese with a bronze bust. 
The bronze busts are life size, and they're supposed to represent the player in the prime of his playing career. Now, they're each an individual work of art. They're made by a process known as lost wax casting of bronze. It's actually a process that dates back to the early Greek and Roman artists who used them. Since the hall opened in 1963, there have been 10 artists who have made busts for the Hall of Fame. There are two busts, interestingly enough, though, that were computer generated during that time. From 1963 until 1982, a man by the name of Jack Worthington was the bust maker, and he made all of the busts basically using a hat size and photographs of the players. In 1983, a young man by the name of Blair Buswell made his first bronze bust for the hall, and he is now our chief bust maker. And in fact, in 2004, his studio assumed the responsibility for making all of the busts that are in the hall at the present time. Now, the process for making the bus actually begins at the Super Bowl. It begins on the day after, at what's often called Measurement Monday. It's when the new enshrinees are measured for their gold jacket, for their Hall of Fame ring, and for their busts. The players will meet with their artist who is going to sculpt their bust, and that Artist will collect photographs of the player when they played, when they're just posing. They'll have video of the player in action. And they'll also then take facial measurements off the player. How far is it from your nose to your chin or from your chin to your ear? So that they're going to get that bust life size exactly like the player. Now, occasionally we enshrine players who have died. And when that happens, the bust maker then simply uses photographs and video of the player, and they assign one of the family members of that player to work with the artist to make sure that the information and the bust looks like the player would desire. Now, once the artist has all of this information, they rough sculpt a clay bust of the player. Once that clay bust has been roughed in, then the artist and the player will get back together again, and that's where they'll begin talking about, you know, what are the details on the bust? Now, this time of working on the details often takes place at the player's home. The artist often likes to get a sense of who the player is and how they interact with others to help create life to the bust as he makes it. Now, interestingly enough, the bust for Jerome Bettis, that detailed ceremony was actually held at the Hall of Fame as they photograph that process for a later time. Now, the interesting thing is that when they meet for this detailed section, it can really change the bus sometimes in dramatic ways. For example, Warren Sapp asked that his bust have braids on it for his hair, something that the artist had not really done up to that point on a bust. and was a little concerned how well that was going to play out. It played out very well when you see Warren Sapp's bust. John Elway wanted to make sure that his famous smile was there with his teeth showing and everything, though very few of the busts have teeth showing when you see them at the hall. One of the interesting stories that I really like is one of the Hall of Famers who played in the 70s when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame by that time in his life had gone bald. And when he met with the artist, he told the artist that, you know, when you make my bust, make sure I have hair again. Now, the artist had the pictures of when the player was playing in the 70s, and he had a huge afro. And so when the artist showed up at the player's home with the roughed-in bust, it was with this huge afro on the player. And I'm told that the player looked at the bust, and he looked at it again, and he finally said to the artist, well, I didn't need that much hair. And the story is that over the next five hours, his wife watched him get a haircut uh, as they trimmed back the amount of hair on the bust that was there. Now, as we said, the busts are actually to show a player in the prime of his playing career. Now, that's not true for coaches and contributors. Those busts can display them at any point uh, in their life cycle. Since it's supposed to show a player in the prime of his playing career, 
that does bring us to one of the enduring mysteries of the bust in the Hall of Fame. And that is, why does the bust of John Unitas not have a flat top? Haven't answered that one yet. But once this bust has been discussed with the player and the artist has worked on it, the whole process for making a clay bust will actually take an artist anywhere from 40 to 50 hours to complete. Now, when he completes the clay bust of the player, the next step is to send that clay bust to the foundry. When they send it to the foundry, the first thing that happens is that they paint the clay bust with a liquid rubber. And this is to create a rubber mold of the clay bust. Now, since rubber is very soft and, and doesn't hold its shape well, they will surround that rubber then with plaster of Paris to provide a rigid protective shell for that rubber bust. Once the rubber and the plastic or the plaster has dried, they will then cut it in two, peel it back away from the, the clay bust, and then once the clay bust has been removed, they will put the halves back together again, fasten it tight, and then begin to create a wax duplicate bust of the clay bust. They do that by taking a low temperature wax, pouring it into the hollow rubber mold, and then twirling it around until that uh, wax covers the entire inside of that rubber mold. Now they'll do that in about two or three layers of wax till they create a wax bust that is about 3 16 to a quarter of an inch thick. Once that wax has cooled and hardened, they then remove the plastic support from around that rubber bust. Then they peel back the rubber mold and that will expose to you a new wax bust just like the clay bust. Now, since it was poured into a mold that was split, there's little work that has to be done to take away the seams and to make sure that that wax bust really looks exactly like the clay bust, which the artist had produced to begin with. Now, once that bust has been touched up and ready to go, the artist will then take uh, tubes of wax and he'll attach them to strategic points on that wax bust to create what are called spruces and gates. Now, the purpose of these spruces and gates tubes of wax is they are going to provide channels for the wax to be uh, let out of the mold and the bronze to be allowed to be poured into the mold to every part of the mold, making sure that it is a complete bronze bust. They now take this wax bust that has been trimmed up and, and worked on, the gates and spruces are on, and they dip it into a ceramic slurry. They take it out of that ceramic slurry and then dip it into sand. And they'll do that about three or four times to build up a ceramic and sand shell around that wax bust. Once that's done, they let it set, and then they begin to heat up the bronze. They'll heat the bronze to about 2,200 degrees temperature. They'll then take this clay bust that has been surrounded by this ceramic and sand slurry. They'll heat it. When that mold is heated, it hardens. But more importantly now, the wax that's inside there begins to run out. And eventually all of the wax runs out and that's why it's called a lost wax casting process. There's no longer any wax left in that sand and ceramic mold. Once all the wax has been removed, they then pour the molten bronze into that warm, empty mold. Once that bronze is cooled, all they do is break off that sand and ceramic mold. When they do that, that ends up freeing up and releasing this new bronze bust that has been made. That then begins a process of needing to clean the bust. There are little bits of that sand and ceramic uh, mold that stay in the cracks and the little creases of this new bronze bust. 
So they begin this cleaning process. They sandblast it, they chip it away. They get it all cleaned of any of that material from the original sand and ceramic mold. As they do that, they'll also expose any imperfections or flaws that may have occurred in the casting process. The artist takes the time then to see that those imperfections are repaired so that the bust again begins to look like the clay bust he originally sculpted. Once the bust is cleaned and repaired, they begin a process of grinding and sanding and buffing and polishing till they get the bust to the stage that they want it to look like from the beginning. Once they have got that bust sanded and polished and buffed, the last stage is they spray the bust with a chemical. And when you put heat to that chemical, that chemical will oxidize. And that process of oxidation is what actually creates the final color and finish on the bronze bust, what we call the patina. Depending upon the chemical they use, that will impact the color that you see on the bust. That's one of the reasons when you're in the hall, some busts look a little more orange or some look a little darker because the artists used different chemicals to create their patina. Once the patina has been created, the artist will then take and put a very thin coat of wax over the bust to protect it. The bust is then packed up and shipped to the Hall of Fame. Now, the simple fact is that there's only one bronze bust made. The bronze bust that you will see in the Hall of Fame is, like I said, the only one that exists. Players in the past used to receive a copy made out of plaster of Paris and painted bronze. Today, they receive an acrylic bronze colored copy of their bust for their own use. The story is that Tom Lander used to use his in his entrance to his house to hang his hat on when he came in the house uh, at home. Now, the bronze busts are hollow. Like I said, they're only about 3 sixteenths to a quarter of an inch thick but they still weigh anywhere from 20 pounds and up. Since no bronze busts have ever been sold, there's no established price. In fact, the bronze busts are priceless. There is no price to be placed on them. So this process of making the bronze bust starts at the Super Bowl. We receive the bronze bust at the Hall of Fame, normally the first week of August, just before enshrinement time. So the entire time that the bust is out with the artist is roughly about six months. And then it goes on display for all of you to see at the Hall of Fame. It's a long process, complicated process, but it creates a beautiful image of that Hall of Famer. That's how they make the bust, Jerry. Well, thank you, Herb. I appreciate that and, uh, you know, um, it's just amazing to see that whole process come to fruition of something like this and then to see when that get when that enshrinement is broadcast and you see our gold jackets go out there with their presenter and unveil that bus because they don't get to actually see it until it's unveiled on national tv right and myself and uh and, and a, a couple other staff members we're the ones that get to be in the green room with the new class and prep them of how they're going to be on tv and what direction they need to go and how they're going to walk up to the bus and unveil it just so it's a smooth production on television and it looks great on television and who's going to take the shroud as you pull it off and all those kind of things but it's amazing to see uh, you know i've been here for 20 years now and i've got to see the greatest football players and what this bust represents are so many things uh you know to see them unveil the bust and just look at it for a minute and whether it's uh you know Deion sanders putting a do-rag on his helmet or on his uh, bust uh just uh, just the admiration respect and there's been opportunities and i know herb has as well is for us to actually see even when the museum is closed and our gold jackets get to walk through here to see them come into that gallery with uh 326 soon to be 346 bronze busts on display and we and trying the, the centennial class this year of 20 and to see them almost break down in tears i mean i've seen people with with three generations of family members with their kids their grandkids great grandkids to see that bust and to see uh because these things we've got to hear the stories herb's got to hear the stories 
of, of, of what these busts stand for. And it stands for those values that we talk about. You know, you hear about the dedication, the commitment, the integrity, the courage. You know, I heard a story the one time that just blew me away. Chris Dolman, who just recently passed away not too long ago. Uh, Chris Dolman shared a story as we were connected with students just like you guys. And he talked about in 30 years of football, from, from Little League all the way through the NFL, he never took a day off. Never took a day off. That's commitment. And that's, that's, that's courage. That's integrity. You know, that's all those things, all those values. So to hear these stories of the bronze bus and, and the stories that are behind them, the commitment, the, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the joy, the sorrow, all the things that go into this, this bust, uh, it's just amazing. And the fact that Herb and myself, we get to kind of, kind of tell these stories, if you will, and bring these busts to life. And that's the beautiful thing about the Hall of Fame is that because we tell a current history, an ongoing history, uh, we have um, artifacts that actually come to life. You know, you can see this bus and they actually talk to the person whose bus it is. And so it's really neat as, as, a, as a staff here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame that we get to do these sorts of things and, and see these bronze busts come to life and tell the stories. And now more than ever, you know, we need these stories because we are, as a country, you know, we are, and as a world, uh, we're facing tough times. And so now more than ever, the, 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 um, uh, the life skills, the values of football teaches, the teamwork, the unity, the love, the, 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 the working together, the unique gifts, all working together in love and unity in pursuit of one common goal. Now more than ever, we need to hear those things because not only is it, when we talk about teams on the football field, we talk about teams as families, we talk about teams in communities, we talk about teams as a country and as a world. And right now, now more than ever, we have to be a team in our country. And we have to do what we're told to do and, and those things like social distancing and, and staying at home right now. Everyone needs to do their job, just like on the football field. If your job is to block, go block. If your job is to throw, go throw. Right now, our job is to stay home, all of us, and, and, and keep our distance uh, until we see the, you know, this, 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 this pandemic relent and, and eventually, We'll be back, you know, back in the classrooms, back in, in workplaces, back in all these different places quicker than we, than we know. And so football is just a great metaphor for life. And what this bronze bus stands for is a great metaphor for life. And so, again, I'm going to go ahead and put this down. Herb, thank you very much for, for, for doing this here today. Uh, we so appreciate you and all your – I mean, he's, he's a volunteer. He's a retired, retired pastor, retired a couple – what's your what, – tell him your background real quick, Herb. Uh, I was 20 years a pastor of the congregation in the area, and uh, since I retired, I've been a part-time pastor at a, a local congregation, and uh, I've spent the last 13 years as a volunteer at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And how many hours do you put at the Hall of Fame? I average 300 a year. 300. Pre now, when you say when you hear the word volunteer, that means unpaid. That means Herb, just out of the 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 the, the kindness of his heart, first of all, but uh, what he believes about football, what he loves about, is it that 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 he's doing that with no cost? I mean, we we, we don't pay Herb. We pay him in, in hugs and, and t-shirts. <laughs> but uh, and he's got one on right now. But uh, uh, but that means that he's just here serving. I uh, want to serve people and use this game to, to help people and use this museum to, uh, to entertain and, and educate and, 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 as you heard, and to inspire people. Uh, we believe that this is the uh, uh, most inspiring place on earth. And so, um, so Herb has been doing this for, for, as you heard him, for many years coming to the Pro Football Hall of Fame and, and volunteering his, his precious time uh, to serve in our, uh, our mission. And so um, today this kind of concludes everything. Uh, we will, uh, you know, anybody that's out there, if you have any questions, you can email us at the Pro Football Hall of Fame at education at profootballhof.com. Uh, and uh, man, we really appreciate your time here today, connecting with us, so just watching the stream. And uh, we just want to say thank you, take care, and God bless everyone. Take care.